They've been here since the beginning of life. Alive, sometimes invisible, but all around us. Scientists have just begun to understand them. But generations of people all over the world intrinsically knew how to harness their power. Bacteria and the chemistry of fermentation have shaped our evolutionary past as much as they're helping us write the future. Perched on a mountain range in southern Chola is the 600-year-old Bikyangsa Temple, the seat of Zen Buddhism and its treasured cuisine. Since ancient times, monasteries have been the centers of development of tea culture. including the uniquely Korean tea, parucha. From her hermitage within the temple complex, Venerable Zhong Kuan has captured the attention of the world's culinary elites. Her kitchen prepares meals for fellow monks, students, and from time to time, chefs of Michelin-starred restaurants. They know her as the master of Buddhist temple food, a vegan cuisine born of seasonal ingredients that nourishes body and soul. Summer is the season for harvesting tea. The plant is believed to have healing properties that help in the path of spiritual enlightenment. Bikyangsa's monks make tea using wild-grown leaves around the monastery. Parucha or oxidized tea, has been produced in Korea since the Three Kingdoms era, nearly 1,200 years ago. A floral, fruity, or multi mouthful, depending on how it's been made. Producing the tea is down to instinct. Chiong Kwan's culinary expertise comes from knowledge passed down by fellow monks over millennia and an intimate understanding of the history and nature of each ingredient. The leaves are rolled vigorously, softening, but taking care not to shred them. The heat from hands kickstarts a controlled fermentation process allowing the mountain air and biochemical wonders to transform the leaves. Once that's done, they are wrapped and left to dry slowly.
In the past, this was done inside the roof of temple buildings. But with modern heating, that job is achieved on the heated floor of a warm room. Over several days, Jung Kwan and her assistants attend to the tea leaves daily. Roll, wrap, repeat. Circulating air and energy. Traditionally, the monks would get different people to handle the leaves, as different hands transfer different microbes. Within the warm and humid blankets, the cell juices released by rolling react with oxygen, turning fresh tea compounds into tannins and complex quinones. The number of variables involved produces unique batches of barucha, each with their own take on the tea's signature woody sweetness. Over in the Philippines, a cottage industry turns a different beverage into one of the nation's favorite tea time treats. From the first domestication of cattle, mankind has been making cheese, a way to preserve milk before refrigeration came about. Almost every country has their own version of this dairy product. In the Philippines, it's the soft, juicy, melt-in-your-mouth quesong puti. The Carabao, a native breed of Asian water buffalo. In the early days of Spanish colonial rule, tamed Carabaos from China were introduced to the Philippines for milking purposes. The thick carabao milk yields the most cheese and is the main ingredient in the soft white quesong puti. An hour's drive from Cebu City is Compostela, known as the queso capital of Cebu. The making of soft white cheeses is one of the earliest cottage industries that grew out of the villages in the Philippines. Merlita Kahlo is one of the most experienced local cheesemakers in the area. Each morning, her husband Nesta takes the carabao down the hill to get away from the house and the road. A peaceful atmosphere ensures a high yield of milk. So it's a do-not-disturb kind of situation. In fact, the feisty animal refuses to be milked by anyone other than Nesta. The milk is quickly delivered to the kitchen. Thank you, Brad. The fresher it is, the more cheese it produces. At 72 degrees Celsius, the milk pasteurizes. Ako ni siya inito lang gatas kay ka nang para nga mapatay ang dry bacteria, mapatay siya sa init niya. Two to three minutes, depende sa kadaghanon sa gatas. A few minutes later, the pot comes off the open fire. Cane vinegar, rennet, or citrus juice, depending on the maker's choice, is slowly added to the warm milk causing it to curdle. The predominant microbes at work are Lactococcus lactis, the bacterium extensively used in the production of yogurt, cheese, and sauerkraut. It's capable of fermenting the sugar or lactose in the milk into acid. This acid causes the casein molecules to partially unfold and link with other casein molecules coagulating the liquid. Rennet speeds up the curdling, and after an hour, the process is complete. 
Salt is used to season the final cheese. The amount of salt impacts its texture. The more salt, the crumblier it gets. Merlita scoops up the curds by hand and lays them onto the salt-coated plate to drain further. The Kalo family produces up to 240 pieces of kesong puti in one morning. Each wrapped in pieces of banana leaves to add flavor. Most of it is sold, delivered, or eaten fresh. The others can be kept for up to two days. Smooth and squashy to touch, this stark white cheese is similar to mozzarella or burrata. It's salty, fatty, and leaves a slightly tart finish on the tongue. This protein-rich indigenous cheese packs a punch in both taste and nutrition. Coffee is one of the most widely consumed beverages in the world. But research shows that wild coffee could run out in 60 years. So what if there's a way to recreate the flavors and aroma of coffee without the actual bean? Singapore a land-scarce island with hardly any agricultural produce of its own. In the fermentation game, the country's entrepreneurs play to their strengths. Food scientist Ding Jie runs a startup that makes coffee without coffee beans. My co-founder, Jake, and I, we found out that there were a lot of ingredients and crops that were under threat from climate change. Coffee faced the same issues and could potentially be endangered. He's here at soybean food and beverage company, Mr. Bean, for their food waste. Soybean pulp, or okara, is a leftover insoluble solid that you get from filtering pureed soybeans. It retains a high proportion of calcium, protein, carbohydrates, and potassium from the legume. Back in the lab, the okara goes into a heat chamber that dries it out. So we're adding specific food grade microbes uh, that will help to break down the soy proteins present in okara. So 
we are going to move it over to the incubator where we will set it at the optimal temperature for the microbes to start to work on your cover. So as it's fermenting, the microbes that we added earlier will start to secrete enzymes. They will essentially eat, digest or break down trends in the inner soybean. So, so these are proteins, carbohydrates and fats. Turning them into amino acids that are then converted into flavours that we are so familiar with in coffee. In South Korea's Baekhyangsa Temple, Venerable Jong Kwan's tea leaves have turned into paryucha. The brown, oxidized leaves are taken out of their blankets and dried, stopping any further oxidation. But for the well-fermented leaves, the journey doesn't stop there. Though strictly vegan, Korean temple food lacks nothing in nutrition. Loaded with protein, fiber, vitamins, and minerals, black soybeans deliver a lot of the same stuff that meat does. A coagulant turns the soy milk into dubu, soft tofu. The set curd is poured into a mold. The cloth holds the curd and lets the whey seep out, allowing it to form into a nice block about half the size and volume. Overnight, the curd turns into tofu. Jung Kwan takes this fresh tofu and tops it with parucha, causing it to ferment even further, going from tofu to a cheese-like state. This elegant and ingenious temple fair is the reason the world comes knocking on its doors. Singapore. A batch of okara, soybean pulp, has been fermenting for 24 hours. It is now ready to be turned into coffee. Bean-free coffee is the brainchild of food scientist Ding Jie, who's trying to solve some of the problems plaguing the coffee production chain. We tapped into my background of food science to create flavour from fermentation. We did a first prototype within one to two weeks of ideation. That prototype didn't taste good at all, but I think that gave us an inkling that a bean-free coffee concept was feasible. We used Okara, that is soy pop, brewer's penguin, that is a byproduct from beer brewing. We also used the surplus bread when ferment them to create coffee flavours. Flavor enhancers are added to the fermented okara to make them taste like coffee.
Then the paste is roasted, allowing Maillard reactions to turn it a rich, dark brown. So this is our bean-free coffee. We have roasted it, ground it. This is the right color, the right consistency. achieving the texture and aroma of what you would find in a pack of ground coffee beans. It smells like coffee, looks like coffee, and tastes like coffee. But it doesn't stop there. Using the same technology, the goal is to create a sustainable portfolio of natural flavors that have been threatened by climate change. Flavors such as cacao, vanilla, and citrus. So that future generations can enjoy a cuppa that's more friendly to the earth. It's not the coffee taste I'm used to, but I like it. I really like this. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.